Yeah? They're, they're, writing, they're writing what on the walls? Kilroy was here. Who's Kilroy? Huh? No? No, no, I have no idea either. No. Maybe it's just a fad. Okay. Yep. May 7th, 1943. It's the last major city the Axis powers hold in Africa. The capital of Tunisia and the last remnant of Mussolini's African empire. But it can hold out no longer. This week, the Allies take Tunis. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Allied Command met yet again to try and decide on the plans for Operation Husky, an invasion of Sicily. The Soviets and the Germans both made attacks in the Kuban, and in Tunisia, the Allies slowly but surely pushed the enemy back towards the sea, though with a large amount of casualties. They continue gaining ground this week. Matur falls to the Americans the third, and this is several days ahead of Army Group Commander Harold Alexander's estimate. A bunch of railway lines and roads converge here, so with its fall, there is no longer any chance of the Axis concentrating force against the British in the Megerda Valley, 35 kilometers to the south. The next stop for the Americans is Bezerta, and the land does flatten out before there, well, there are a few foothills just before it, but it is now terrain that is pretty decent for tanks. And Alexander has the U.S. 1st Armored Division scheduled to attack Bezerta the 6th, while at the same time, British 1st Army is to launch a huge attack against Tunis. That operation is named Strike and begins at 3 a.m. the 6th with the largest artillery barrage seen on the African continent. This is from 400 big guns and is against targets about 10 kilometers south of the Majerda River. The plotting is one shell for every six feet of enemy ground. By comparison, at El Alamein, it had been one for every 30 feet. At 5.40 a.m. after the guns comes the first of more than 2,000 sorties Allied planes fly just this day. Before dawn, the infantry begins its advance along a three kilometer front. First Army has been reinforced with 30,000 8th Army troops. And by daybreak, the British 4th Division and 4th Indian Division have broken a four kilometer gap in the enemy lines. And into that gap rush four battalions of tanks. Hans-Jürgen von Arnim, who commands Heeres Group of Africa, knows from intercepted radio traffic where the Allies plan to attack, but it makes no difference. He does not have the force to stop it. By 11 a.m., the armor has penetrated five kilometers, basically destroying what was left of the 15th Panzers. Kenneth Anderson, commanding 1st Army, had wanted his tanks to stick around and mop up enemy stragglers, but Alexander nixes this and orders them to keep driving top speed towards Tunis. Here's a description from Rick Atkinson in An Army at Dawn. The whole valley before us became a heaving sea of flame, wrote the American journalist John McVeigh. Over a dozen roads and trails, plumes of flowery dust rose from the columns of the vehicles. The stink of cordite and crushed wheat was enough to bring some men to their knees. By this time, Allied radio is intercepting Axis radio traffic, ordering medical personnel to pick up rifles and enter the battle lines. Soon after this, the walking wounded are ordered to join them. Von Arnhem's quartermaster tells Italy to not send any more ammunition since they have no fuel to distribute it anyhow. The Allied radios keep blasting out the word butter, 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 which is the code word for the vanguard to press on. By nightfall, two armored divisions have reached Massacult, 14 kilometers ahead of the infantry. From the hilltops, they can see Tunis. And the troops there are not going anywhere. 18 Royal Navy destroyers patrolled the Sicilian Straits to prevent any last-minute access to Catman. The ship's superstructures had been painted an unmistakable royal red after three accidental bombings by overzealous Allied planes. All waters within five miles of the Tunisian coast were declared a free-fire zone, and Eisenhower's naval chief soon reduced his order of the day to seven words. Sink, burn, and destroy. Let nothing pass. The Americans are, of course, attacking towards Bizarre to the 6th, as I said. By this morning, the 7th, tanks are rumbling into Ferryville. The graffito, Kilroy was here, appears on local walls and road signs. These tanks of the 1st Armored have effectively cut the Axis beachhead in half, and the 9th Division is driving on Bizarre itself. Advance units reach the city by 4 p.m., but it is a dead city. 
really, it has just been destroyed, just completely gutted. The shipyards, the houses are rubble. The bombing has been that complete. To escape it, the Axis forces have relocated to tents west of the town. Sure, they have a rear guard and, and snipers on the roofs and things like that. But by this morning, the last German resistors have either left or are dead. The Corps Franck d'Afrique have the honor of formally capturing Bizerta. Tunis also falls today at 3.30 p.m. despite a delaying action there. Now, the port of Tunis has been wrecked, but the rest of the city, unlike Bizerta, is in pretty good shape, and a lot of the city's residents have remained during the entire occupation. They parade through the streets this day, cheering their liberators, while the Axis forces spike their big guns, burn their remaining fuel dumps, and crush their small arms under panzers. The capital has fallen, but there are German and Italian troops still in the field. It remains to be seen whether or not Van Arnhem can turn the Cap Bon Peninsula into a fortress that would require a proper siege to overcome. Italy's situation itself is interesting. I mean, they're not exactly an equal partner with Germany or anything. John Keegan has a lot to say about it. It was not only that Italy's economy could support only one-tenth of the military expenditure met by Germany, it was that Italy's military strength had declined absolutely during the interwar period, so it was less a match for Britain and France in 1940 than it had been for Austria in 1915. Italian divisions were weaker in infantry and artillery than 25 years earlier. Italian manpower had continued to decline through the surge of emigration to the United States. Italian equipment, though elegant and brilliantly engineered, was produced by artisan methods, which could not match the output of British and eventually American factories working to volume demands. Italian tanks and aircraft were a whole generation outdated by their British equivalents. There's something else that also affects Italy's commitment to Germany's war, and that's the enemies that Germany has chosen for Italy. The Italian peasantry really like and even admire the United States, and the Italian upper classes are Anglophiles. Combine that with the fact that the over 350,000 men Italy has lost just as POWs in the various North African campaigns is more men than they had stationed in their whole African empire before the war. Combine that with the disaster that hit the 220,000 men of the Italian 8th Army during Stalingrad and Little Saturn a few months ago. And the fact that the Italian armed forces are but a shadow of what they were last year, and you get that Italian high command, made up very much of generals from Savoy, Piedmont, who are big supporters of the crown, has by now seriously begun questioning the wisdom of continued support from Mussolini and the Axis war effort. The men running Germany's war effort are meeting this week, on the 3rd, in Munich. This is to talk about Operation Citadel, the Axis upcoming offensive plans against the Soviets in the Kursk salient. After three days of consideration, Hitler decides to postpone the operation until June 12th, so that more reinforcements can be sent to the armies involved. I've talked before about the basic idea that Erich von Manstein and Hermann Holt would smash through the enemy north of Belgorod, advance some 115 kilometers, and link up with Walter Model in a pincer attack. This is planned to take five days total, and the primary objective, Kursk, is a main road and railway junction. Considering the advances the Axis forces made in the Soviet Union in 1941-1942, that distance seems pretty reasonable. But the planning isn't really the same. I mean, it's been obvious to all for weeks that the Soviets are reinforcing the Kursk salient. But Adolf Hitler has promised Manstein substantial extra forces, including both Tiger tanks and the new Panther tanks that he is super fond of. And he figures, well, oh, it'll be a cakewalk. Yet others were not so sure, as intelligence collection in April revealed the extent of Soviet defensive preparations. Germany's proven Bewegungskrieg, mobile warfare doctrine, had succeeded by massing combat power into a Schwerpunkt against the enemy's weakest points, enabling a breakthrough. Yet at Kursk, the OKH 
ignored this proven method and committed the Schwerpunkt against what was likely to be the strongest points in the enemy's defense, a clear violation of doctrine. Model in particular did not relish the idea of a costly frontal attack against an alert enemy and believed the offensive would be a Pyrrhic victory at best. Model does point out that during the spring lull, the Soviets have been really busy building multiple defense lines in the salient, and there will not be any sort of surprise when they attack. He and Heinz Guderian, Inspector General of the Armed Forces, think what they should be doing instead is building up a big mobile reserve that would be able to fight off Soviet offensives. Model actually wrote a memo in late April about all of this, including recon photos showing the Soviet defenses at the base of the salient. He thinks his 9th Army should remain on defense until the Soviets reach Orel, and then the reserves would cut off and destroy the Soviet spearheads, kind of like they did last fall when the Soviets launched Operation Mars. Hitler, however, is not interested in playing defense, so Citadel will happen. But he was actually influenced enough by Model to postpone it until reinforcements could be brought in, so there is that. For their part, the Soviets are attacking this week. Down in the Kuban, they are attacking yet again towards Krimskaya. However, Georgi Zhukov has ordered the attacks to come from a more southerly axis, so it's the 10th Rifle Guards Corps that does the main attacks. On the morning of the 1st, Soviet artillery hits the Romanians south of the city, then the guards move in. The defenses hold that day, but on the 3rd, with other formations of 56 Army also attacking and with heavy air support, they begin to make real headway. By the 4th, the 97th Jager Division finds itself in a salient between the Soviet 37th Army to the north and the 56th to the south, and the railway link to Novorossiysk has been cut. So to avoid being outflanked, that night, the Axis evacuate Krimskaya and pull back to the D-Stellung defense line. But the Soviets continue the offensive the rest of the week, even after liberating Krimskaya, though the exhausted men of the 56th Army do not make any headway the rest of the week against D-Stellung. Meanwhile, the Soviet 9th Army is sending brigade-sized forces into the coastal marshes of the Sea of Azov to try to capture the smaller German outposts. The Germans, reinforced with mountain troops the 5th, however, Richard Ruoff, commander of the German 17th Army, is worried about a possible Soviet amphibious landing on the Azov coast, which might cut off his communications with the Taman Peninsula. So he stations 4,500 Romanian and German troops here against such an eventuality. The Luftwaffe is also brought in to protect his left flank from 9th Army infiltration, and it does a good job inflicting fairly heavy losses. The Allies are planning an amphibious landing, yeah, just not in the USSR. Mediterranean Commander-in-Chief Dwight Eisenhower and his commanders meet yet again to talk about Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily. This time they meet in Algiers on the 2nd. British 8th Army Commander Montgomery is there in person to argue the plan his acting chief of staff argued last week, a combined British and American assault on the southeast corner of the island with the Americans hitting the Pacino Peninsula and the British the Gulf of Noto. On the 3rd, Eisenhower gives it the green light and gets rid of all the attempted tinkering with it. No southwestern assault on D-Day plus 2. No assault on Palermo on D-Day plus 5. Instead, the Western Task Force was to be shifted to the southeastern landing. In doing so, Eisenhower accepted the risks associated with failure to bring Palermo online as a functioning port, thereby casting aside the evident teaching of the North African operation that an invading force must have at its disposal a functioning port within 48 hours of landing. Eisenhower relied on three elements in assuming this risk, namely one, the more favorable summer weather, two, the certainty of sea and air superiority, and three, the availability of the DUKW, a technical innovation which had been lacking in the torch landings. The plan is now submitted to the combined chiefs of staff. We'll see what they think soon enough. The DUKW, usually just called duck or duck boat, is an amphibious vehicle. They took the 6x6 Jimmy trucks, the General Motors CCKW, and basically added a watertight hull and a propeller. They can go 80 kilometers per hour on roads and around 10 on water. 
According to General Motors nomenclature, the letters D are the production year, U for utility, K for being all wheel drive, and W for having tandem rear axles. They have yet to be used by an invasion force. Perhaps they'll soon choose an attack date. There is one new attack launched this week, though, a Japanese one. On the 5th, the Battle of Eshi begins. See, the Japanese have controlled Wuhan since 1938 and Yi Chang, which is further up the Yangtze River since 1940. They have not, however, been able to use the river between the two cities because of Chinese activity, mainly by the 128th Division. This is particularly irksome since the Japanese have a decent sized fleet at Wuhan and 53 captured Chinese barges at Yi Chang. So on the 5th, the Japanese 3rd Division attacks. The next morning, two Chinese divisions, the 77th and 15th, counterattack in the border area between Hubei and Hunan provinces. This is not very successful and produces a lot of casualties. Today, as the week ends, the Japanese capture Anxian County, Hunan province. And as their week ends, so does mine. With action in central China and the southern USSR, both Bizerta and Tunis falling to the Allies, and important plans for summer attacks being made by both sides. Interesting that Model wants to play defense, but we know Hitler won't do that. Not in the USSR, and not anywhere at all if he can help it. He wants the strategic initiative. Another great summer victory. That will at least help the flagging morale of his allies. But they will be attacking the strongest Soviet points. But that's okay, because if they succeed, it will indeed be a great victory beating the Soviets by breaking through their strongest defenses, if they succeed. The war in China has been a quiet stalemate for many months now, until this week. But what's going on behind the scenes in the intelligence war? Check out this Spies and Ties episode about Chinese spy masters to find out. And if you, like us, wish to see more preservation of our history, free from outside influence and bias, then join the Time Ghost Army and make it with us. These are our newest officers, and Marie's Ule is our Army Member of the Week. You can join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. So that can be you one day. See you next time. Mm -hmm.